start. Hello, I'm Professor Claire Hopkins. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak tonight. I'm going to talk a little bit about implementing precision medicine in rhinology and where better endotyping or subgrouping of our patients will contribute to delivering precision medicine in the future. So precision medicine really is an aspiration for the future. And the idea is that if we better understand how an individual's genetics, environment, lifestyle, and disease characteristics all contribute to their underlying disease, we can better determine how to approach both disease prevention, which is obviously the goal, but also better disease management. There are four key principles in precision medicine. It should be predictive. We should be able to identify those at risk of disease. It should be preventative. We should try and find ways to prevent those at risk from developing clinical, clinically active disease. It should be personalised, and this is where endotyping will really come into its own. It should be participatory. Patients should be empowered to be active and managers of their own condition. Now, in the future, I imagine that patients will come to our clinics. They'll have a blood test taken, perhaps a blood spot, perhaps a mucus sample taken by a wire brush. We'll feed this into a computer and it will give us a printout telling us exactly what type of CRS the patient's suffering from and how we might best treat it. I suspect in the future that treating CRS with antibiotics and with very non-selective steroids will really become a thing of the past. And instead, we'll have very tailored medicines such as specific biologics that will address them. Perhaps even in the future, surgery for sinus disease will become a thing of the past. But this is all some way off. And the problem with all of this is that all of these tests cost a lot of money. And certainly in the NHS where I work, we've run out of money and we're trying to deliver better quality care, but increasingly on smaller and more restricted budgets. So I'm going to rename my talk, How We Can Implement Precision Medicine in Rhinology, but on the cheap, in as cost-effective manner as possible. So starting with predictive, can we identify which patients are at risk of developing chronic rhinus sinusitis? Well, we don't know much about risk factors, but we do know that we have certain populations who are at higher risk. For example, patients with asthma, aspirin-sensitive respiratory disease, those with cystic fibrosis. And these would be good patients that we might employ screening programs. These patients often have undiagnosed upper respiratory disease, which contributes to their overall mor morbidity. So if we just encourage our colleagues in respiratory clinics, for example, to ask a very simple question about a patient's sense of smell, we might pick up a lot of these patients. And actually, anosmia has an 80% positive predictive value for finding nasal colic. So this might be a good start and very cheap to deliver. We know that anomalies associated with a bitter taste receptor are also predictive of a higher susceptibility to CRS and that non-tasters have higher rates of bacterial colonisation. So perhaps you might screen patients in the community for whether they can taste PTC, a very simple and cheap test to identify those at risk. One of the problems with this approach at the moment, however, is although we might achieve early identification, we haven't yet found ways to modify the development of disease and actually prevent it from happening. There are some things that we know are associated with a much higher risk, both in terms of developing disease, but also greater disease severity. And perhaps the most important, most widespread is smoking. About 40% of European adults continue to smoke with similar rates, but it's slightly lower in the United States. And this is a key area that we need to focus on our efforts. We know that smoking is associated with a higher risk of developing chronic rhinosinusitis, and it's dose dependent. So there's a 1.5% increase in risk for every additional year of smoking. The Galen study showed that nearly double the risk of developing chronic rhinosinusitis in smokers compared to non-smokers. Passive smoking also increases the risk of developing chronic rhinosinusitis in adult life if you're exposed to cigarette smoke in childhood. We also know that patients who develop chronic rhinus sinusitis have poorer outcomes from medical treatment and most importantly from surgery if they continue to smoke. So again, this is another area that we can target to try and improve outcomes for our patients. So we really need to think about smoking cessation at every clinical visit and try and counsel our patients. We need to get them to actively engage in services to try and help them quit. What about other things that might be involved at higher risk? Now, this is a really interesting slide that looks at the development of chronic rhinosinusitis 
in the first responders to the 9-11 World Trade Center disaster. And the first responders were exposed to very high levels of dust, toxic chemicals, and all kinds of awful things. And they've gone on to develop very high rates of chronic disease. But what's very interesting is that they also develop very high rates of chronic rhinosinusitis, up to 50% in some groups. And if you look at how much exposure these first responders had, you can classify them into three groups. Those that attended very early on in the first four hours of the towers coming down, those that were in the second wave between four and 12 hours, and those that came in later. And so those that arrived first at the towers had the very highest level of exposure to dust and irritants. And you can see that they have much higher rates of developing CRS, up to 50%, compared to those with lower levels of irritant exposure. This was a single point in time of exposure, but it's affected their risk of developing chronic rhinosinusitis in the 10 years afterwards. And I think this is the first really convincing evidence that I've seen that occupational exposure can make a real difference to the risk of developing chronic rhinosinusitis. Again, we're quite limited in what we can do, but it's certainly something we should be asking our patients about the air quality in the place of work and pollution levels, for example. And as much as we have the power to, we should lobby governments to try and reduce exposure to irritants, put in safety measures, and try and improve air quality in general. Now, the next key tenant of, of precision medicine is that it should be personalized. And that's exactly where chronic rhinosinusitis is a problem. We have this huge mixed bag of conditions that we put together under one subheading. We might have patients with polyps. We might have some with allergic fungal disease. We might have patients that have a simple dental infection mixed in with those with secondary CRS and high levels of bacterial colonization. And we put them under all one umbrella at the moment and try and find a one-size-fits-all approach to treatment. And obviously that's not going to work. What we want to better do is to sort our patients into groups so we can have homogenous disease groups that will have a predictable response to different types of treatment. And that really is the key feature of personalised medicine. Now, at the moment, we have two main groups, and we use these in guidelines, such as the EPOS guideline, which is available from rhinologyjournal.com. We have two main groups, patients with polyps and those without. And largely, we know that they differ in their response to different types of treatment. So here, for example, we can see the algorithm for patients with polyps. This is a predominantly inflammatory condition, so the mainstay of treatment is to use topical steroids, be it in the forms of sprays or drops, or oral steroids when the problem is more severe. There's very little role for antibiotics in this group, although there may be some use in doxycycline, possibly as an immune modulator. But again, if this doesn't approach doesn't work, we'll consider surgery in our patients. In contrast, the group of patients without nasal polyps, we would again treat with intranasal corticosteroids and saline. In this group, we'd also be considering the use of sometimes low-dose macrolide antibiotics. So this is more, again, of an immunomodulatory drug. But we know that the patients in this group are more likely to respond to macrolide, particularly if their IgE is not elevated. So again, already in this pathway, we're seeing different biomarkers being used to try and help predict response to treatment. But again, the problem with this is this simple classification into patients with polyps and those without isn't a clear dichotomy. They're not two obviously very distinct groups. And there's certainly some overlap in the middle. For example, what about the patients who have polyps in their CT scans but aren't visible on their endoscopy? Where do you put those? And a bigger problem with this classification is it also depends on how well you can look into the nose. So for example, if you're in primary care and you only have access to rhinoscopy, you're going to be much less likely to see small nasal polyps and if you have an endoscope in the clinic. So it's perhaps a little more limiting for primary care doctors. There is a significant overlap in the middle, and we know that about 20% of patients with chronic rhinosinusitis without nasal polyps actually exhibit the immune profile of patients with polyps. They just simply haven't developed their polyps yet. So we want to try and better classify these patients so we can more accurately split them into their different groups and better treat them. As I said, it relies on their endoscopic appearances. It doesn't consider what's going on within the sinuses unless there's been previous surgery. And we know that at least 20% of those without polyps exhibit this TH2 type profile. Endotypes, in contrast, 
use biomarkers or biological tests to better guide treatment and prognosis. Now we've known for some time that there are two large groups, patients that exhibit a TH2 type inflammatory response, where they have high levels of IL-4, IL-5, IL-13, they might show raised IgE, and they're characterized by eosinophilia. And this is typically, but not completely associated with the group of patients that have nasal polyps. We also have a group of patients with TH1 type response, the interferon gamma, increased matrix and color proteinase, neutrophilia and fibrosis. And this, again, not exclusively, but more commonly is associated with those patients without nasal polyps. We're learning about other groups too, TH17, for example. I'm sure this list is going to expand significantly over time. Class facets group in Ghent has done some excellent work in this area, and they've identified at least 10 different types of endotype clusters based on levels, for example, of IL-5 and Staph aureus superantigens. And you can see from the graph on the right that some of these different clusters are associated almost exclusively, but again, not completely, with the polyp phenotype. Whereas at the top end, it's much more a group without polyps. It's also related to the risk of asthma. So we're starting to hone in on that mixed bag of sweets at the beginning and try and much better define our group of patients. But this involves, to identify the bottom group, for example, testing at least six or seven different cytokines, be that in mucus, in histology, or in blood tests. And again, that all adds to the cost of managing what is a very common condition. Chronic rhinus bronchitis affects 10% of the population. So it's perhaps not realistic to take this level of detail in all our patients. Is there a way, therefore, based on some simple questions and what we can see, that we can approach this and to some extent. So this is how I approach patients in my clinic. And as you can see from the slide, I take an approach of trying to end a type for free, so without any additional tests. First of all, I want to establish that the patient has chronic rhinosinusitis. So I'll apply the EPOS definition of at least two symptoms, one of which would be nasal obstruction or nasal discharge, and or facial pain and pressure, and all of the symptoms of mouth. And using that, I can establish that the patient's had chronic rhinosinusitis if their symptoms have persisted for at least three months. I'll then look in the nose with an endoscope and see if I can see any visible nasal polyps or not. If I can see nasal polyps, then it's likely that the patient has type 2 inflammation, and I'll treat them according to the EPOS algorithm for nasal polyps. But there's another important subgroup within this that has been really well described by Richard and Ray involved in the call tonight, and also John Delgadio and Sarah Wise's group in the state. And this group has what we now term central allergic compartment disease. They have a significant allergic drive to their underlying inflammation and sinusitis. They might have polyps coming off the middle of the disease focused particularly in the ethmoid, and relative sparing of the frontal sinuses and the maxillary sinuses on CT images. They might not even have frank polyps, but just have simple edema of the head of the middle turbinate. And having read the papers published from Rich and Ray, I found this a really useful sign to look at from my clinical practice. And it will really drive me to focus on the patient's allergies and management of those to try and optimise their outcomes. I then consider patients who don't have any visible polyps. And I ask them about any personal or family history of asthma or allergies. Those that had asthma in childhood again, more likely to fall into the group with TH2 type inflammation. Those that have no history of asthma or allergies are likely to be TH type 1, and I'll treat those very much as a non-polyp patient and follow the appropriate algorithm. When you have patients with adult onset asthma, and they're a slightly more complicated group. Those who are older smoking males and obese females are most likely to fall into the TH1 group. But the rest of patients who are not overweight and non-smokers are likely to have TH2 inflammation. And again, I'll treat these patients as a polyp patient. And there are some clear differences between the two algorithms. For example, in patients without polyps, there is no recommendation to use oral steroids at all, partly because there's no evidence upon which to really guide that, that decision. But if they have adult onset asthma or other features, then I might consider the use of steroids in patients, even if I don't see frank polyps in the nose. And when I come to surgery, I will try and achieve more open access to the sinus cavities to improve access to topical steroids postoperatively. So I think just asking a few simple questions in the clinic can really better help us to define our patient population, particularly when we can't see frank polyps, but the patients have features as if they may better belong to that group. 
final part of uh, precision medicine is that it should be participatory. And certainly the most cost-effective healthcare is self-management. It's ideally suited to chronic relapsing conditions such as chronic rhinus and It's really important because actually we know that compliance really poor in patients with chronic rhinosinusitis. There was a nice study done by Luke Rudnick's group in Canada, and they found that only 20% of patients with chronic rhinosinusitis are currently using an intranasal corticosteroid. Now that might be a little bit of under-prescribing, and it might simply be that the patients haven't bothered to collect their prescription. Even those that use it, they often fail to use it regularly, so they collect on average two bottles of spray a year, when it should only really last a month or six weeks, so they're perhaps even only using about 20% of the amount that they're prescribed. So we need ways to try and improve patient compliance, and that must be by actively engaging them in their care. So we've been working on some different approaches, for example, using a smartphone app. This is my sinusitis code, and it encourages patients to enter their symptom levels on a visual analog scale on a daily basis, and it will remind patients if their compliance isn't as good as it used to be. So it will really encourage patients to use their sprays regularly to consider when they need to go back and see their primary care doctor or their ENT doctor. And it just gives them more information as to where, how they're doing overall and when they're starting to fall off track a little bit. It's also been shown that using things such as this chronic sinusitis action plan um, to give patients written information after consultation can really help in, engage patients and improve compliance. So this has come from a group in East Canada with Martin de Rosier, where patients are given a clear plan. They're told what type of sinus disease they have. You can see it's at the top I have with or without nasal polyps. And it will guide them as to what treatment they should be using on a daily basis, what to expect when they're getting worse, so when their control is starting to fail and what they should do. And it also clearly signposts when they need to seek immediate help from either the emergency room or their ENT doctor. So again, send patients away with this with better instruction and help improve their management. So in summary, precision medicine is likely to achieve improved outcomes for our patients with chronic rhinosinusitis. Better subgrouping of patients is absolutely central to implementing personalised precision medicine. Hopefully I've shown that a few simple questions in clinic may improve our ability to better subgroup our patients, and therefore better identify how to treat them. And certainly this endotyping will become much more in the future, much more important in the future, when we have better biomarkers to guide best management for our patients. Thank you very much for your attention.